All right. Uh, my name is Jared Powell. I'm a therapist. I'm here with Kimberly Cokerhands, who is a survivor of childhood human sex trafficking and ritual abuse, who has worked for years to not only continue the fight for her own recovery and help others through peer support, uh, but also take it to a new level, both by educating the treatment community, by sharing her own story, and starting a nonprofit that she's now filed the 501c3 for the it's called the human or the received it received our 501c3 received it right for the healing center for complex trauma and so if i understand right uh kimberly this this organization you're working to build it's going to directly provide better help for people that are often judged misunderstood and not given adequately flexible and impactful therapy when they really need it most people yes. like yourself who have been slipping through the cracks with uh, you know, severe, severe symptoms after horrific uh, challenges. And so um, I was hoping that this conversation could help educate both clinicians and doctors, professional case managers that are kind of out there doing the work, and also the caregivers, the people in the community who are the friends and the neighbors of those who've survived these things to just add just a little more information about um, some of the understanding that you've gained, some of the gaps you're trying to bridge. Is that okay with you? Yeah, absolutely. All right, great. So I understand that while there were those people in the healthcare system that believed and understood you, there were also people that didn't. Can you describe uh, some of your experiences with that when you were coming out of the, the cult abuse and trafficking and into the sort of healing arena? Yeah, so I'm advanced in age. I'm 50. So when, when all of this wasn't as much known about trauma and the complexities and the impact on the brain or the impact on someone's entire being as there is now. And even now it's it's still emerging. There aren't quite as many people as trauma-informed fully as I, I would hope. And so I'm, I am grateful to be here. For this. Um, for me, a lot of my symptoms were really bizarre. And now people know what they are, like flashbacks or ab reactions. You can call it a myriad of things. But I was having physical and mental, emotional and psychological reactions to trauma. I was manifesting memories and, and what it had happened to me in a way that was frightening for people. They thought I was having seizures. They weren't quite sure what was happening, as was I. I, I didn't know because I had dissociated. I, I repressed all of the memories of, of sexual abuse and, and torture and trauma on that level. I'd suppress it so I had no words. I had no way to explain what was happening to me. I was just overcome. And, and that was not normal. I know it's fairly extreme, my symptoms, but it's not unique. You know, there are varying degrees of the way, a way that might manifest with someone. And usually when there are no words, there will be a symptom. There will be some manifestation in one way or another uh, that there's something wrong. And so learning to detect that is, is something that we can work on. But for me, um, understanding dissociation, understanding the deep, deep, deep levels of, of trauma was, I, I still don't know that it's understood. I still don't know that people quite have a grasp. And, and so sometimes I was treated kindly, but after maybe years of certain symptoms not dissipating, such as like flashbacks or triggers or not being able to handle certain people or certain behaviors in, in people, you know, I, I would be judged as someone who wasn't trying to get better, as someone who was manipulating. I mean, you can come up with any, any kind of negative connotation to that. I think often therapists need to be right. They're in a helping profession. Their whole intention, hopefully, is altruistic. They want to help. And when they can't help and they've exhausted all of this, these skills that they've paid 
tons of money for, and they put in tons of hours, and they've read these books, they've gone to these seminars, they've gone to these trainings, they think, I have the answers, it, it can't be me, it must be you. And so there isn't a good, bad, there isn't a right, wrong. And I was definitely judged. And in different hospital stays, am I going on too much? No, no, you're fine. You're okay. Stay on. And it's well okay. said. <laughs> Um, I, I did have individual therapy, but it was definitely not adequate. I think, again, I think I was more of a novelty in some ways because I have DID, I have all of these extreme traumas, extreme, and we're talking torture and like you said, ritual abuse and human trafficking was in that world. I, I think I was more interesting than a human in some ways and I hated that because I was already being exploited and so now I was being exploited by caregivers who were just oh my gosh I have someone who's multiple oh my gosh you know and more voyeuristic in in some ways rather than helpful and that wasn't all you know definitely there were people that would step up and try to understand but I, I think in some ways, once we think we have all the answers, we're really not helpful because there are so many variables and unknowns. Each person reacts to trauma in such different ways. And the healing journey is so different for each person that we can't go in there and just give marching orders and, and think we, we have it. Even as a survivor, when I've tried to impose my knowledge or my understanding on people sometimes it's not welcome they they need to have their own experience and their own journey and i get to accompany them and so i think sometimes we forget our space as as a helper and and again understanding i i wrote down some notes for a question you might ask a little bit later but someone who's experienced trauma their entire system is affected. It, it affects everything. Their perception of the world, their map of the world, everything is affected. And you can't expect to just go in and have someone tell you what happened and do some breathing exercises and have it no longer affect them. And so I, I know that I've had, not very many, many people have been able to stay with me through the longevity of healing and i'm still healing and i i am still afraid that people will check out because i'm you know it's taking so freaking long but um again because some of my behaviors were so bizarre and scary like suicide self-harm taking off flashbacks really it, it dissociating not knowing where i was who who was around me and refusing help in so many ways because I didn't know someone or, or know what was going on. Um, that's scary. That's really scary. And so the human element of any, everyone involved needs to be factored in. So I, I do understand it, but at some point, someone needs to be there that kind of gets it on a deeper level and can accommodate and keep everyone safe and, you know, help sort it out. And um, I don't know, sorry, that's my phone. I had it up here, find phone numbers for you. But um, I could talk about a time something went well, and some, a time something went really bad, if you want, with regards oh, sure. to that. Oh, <laughs> sure. I mean, you know, I mean, the problem is real, Kim, that you're, that you're describing. I still remember being a new clinician. It was, it was uh, almost 15 years ago now. And I remember just going in and, and having these discussions when we would see some really intense, bizarre self-sabotage and, and, and uh, all of the damage to self, the violence. And, and a lot of times it would turn into, oh, she's so borderline-y, or oh, she's being so manipulative, like you said, or oh, she's really splitting staff right now. And there was this judging sort of vibe going on and you've had experiences like that and yeah if oh you my gosh mostly 
Yeah, yeah. I'd, love, I'd love to hear something that went well and something that didn't go so well. That would be great. Well, and, and just the words manipulating and things like that that you said, I, every th single thing that you've just said has been said about me when I've been in the hospital or, or whatever, it, you know. And I, I think we need to step back. And I have a whole um, presentation I can do on this. On, on how to really engage you know, with someone who has the extreme symptoms and as a provider. But I, I think we need to honor that this person has just survived the un, unimaginable, the unbearable, the unsurvivable. You know, if, if the real brain, if the present focused, alert, mindful brain was was present, it would not be able to handle it. So somehow it had to get really, really creative. It had to really morph and do something fantastic to survive, which is sometimes manipulating, which is some is learning how to survive whatever it takes. And although those skills serve them at one point, they may no longer serve them now, but I think honoring that they did whatever they had to do and then helping them grow farther, if that is their wish, is something that's very important. But I think, you know, demonizing behavior and saying good, bad is, is not a healthy and helpful approach. And, you know, was I manipulating? Was I not manipulating? I don't know. I was having flashbacks. Some people liked me, some people didn't. Is that staff splitting? I think that's more character than staff, you know? It, it's it, it, it people you know i don't know people just make choices and they make judgments and i feel like the more we catch ourselves in a space of judging and determining things that we're really not qualified to because we're not in their internal structure we're not there listening to their thoughts and feeling their feelings and their triggers we're, we're not on the inside we can only work with what we we can observe and, and are told and then understand there's a whole like that ice um iceberg you know there's so much down here that we can't we don't have access to and just allow that maybe this is a a person who is engaging because they're they're hurting they they don't have answers they can't even articulate questions and so this is going to take some time and um i don't know so I'll say that one of the times went bad. It, things have gone so bad over the years. This one was kind of epic though. So I've been in the psych ward at a hospital. I've been in several. I did the math. I spent about a year and a half total of my life in the hospitals and um, a homeless shelter. So that's how you get raised, right? But, um, and that's just because of being suicidal or having so many flashbacks, I wasn't able to function and self-harm. So all of the things that you can think of, that's what was going on. And I had gotten out and I wasn't one to ask for help because I didn't want to be labeled as manipulative because I, I knew I often didn't respond because I'm multiple or DID. I, my parts would come and go so fast that I don't know. It was just, it was rough, but I was, I was cutting. This was when I was 20, I wanna say 21, maybe 22. So it's been a while. Mm -hmm. And I called the crisis line of the hospital that I had just left. And they were talking to me and then I'm like, no, never mind. You know, and I'm one of those, if I decide to do something, I'm gonna do it. It's on me, it's not on anyone else. I'm gonna cut you off. I'll take care of myself, which is good and bad, but they had recognized my name, my voice because I'd been there. And so they sent paramedics and they tracked me down. They found me and my roommates didn't know what was going on. They answered the door and they asked for me and I just freaked out and ran and they tackled me and I just went into flashbacks. They hauled me off in the, um, in the ambulance to the hospital where I proceeded to have more flashbacks in the ER. I mean, I'm in freaking trauma. I am having a trauma response and 
I've now been apprehended, hauled into an ER. So trauma, trauma, trauma on top of trauma. And I was on the, the hospital bed and I continued to have a flashback. And when I finally came out and I don't know how long it was, it was, I don't know, they sometimes would last a while. The nurse said, well, if you're done with theatrics, we can proceed to examine you. I'm like, we're done. All right. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I'm leaving. And she said, well, you have to sign this. So I signed it and just walked my butt home. But it, it was, oh my gosh, that's already humiliating. Everyone is seeing. It's terrifying. It's scary. I can't stop it. I can't do much about it. And then the help is labeling and accusing and not helpful. I've been, you know, in, in those situations tied down because I don't know why that is a response to a flashback. I don't think people knew what they were. And sometimes I would hurt myself, but not always. And, you know, it's, it's just, it's terrifying. Healing from trauma is as traumatic as the trauma in a lot of cases. So really, I mean, speaking of, like, this is the exact opposite of the honoring that's really needed. The, the good yeah. examples were the folks that recognized, you know, she's living in a dark world. The, you know, the, the gates are broken open and she's still in there, you know, and it's like she doesn't know that she can actually get out, you know, and on some level, some part of her doesn't think that she's free, you know, as, or maybe multiple parts don't think that she's free. Right. Oh, gosh. And yes, and multiple parts, <laughs> that's... Yeah, we've had wonderful conversations. And honestly, as I've seen this phenomenon here and there, you know, with the really acute cases and sometimes the confusing violence and the confusing rage, uh, then coupled with looking, this person looking so on top of it, sometimes overly submissive, but sometimes super compliant, sometimes super smart. You see their intelligence, their creativity, their, creativity, their, their capability, their talent. And then you see this, this, this part that's just freaking out, monstrous, afraid, dangerous, violent, self-harming, uh, and hating, and and hating you as the caregiver, you know. And it's and and recognizing it's like, you know, learning the the understanding that you're saying is exactly what clinicians need to to hear from people with lived experience, so that they can understand. When I see this, there's more than meets the eye, and it's probably. I mean, even though there probably are times when people are malinger, malingering or manipulative, especially if you work with the prison population a lot, even with the prison population, there's going to be people where you are seeing multiples, you're seeing multiplicity, you're seeing um, wh wh whatever the diagnosis, whether they call it DID, whether they call it DDNOS, whether they call it PTSD, uh, that, that you're seeing somebody who part of them is living in a much darker world than they're in right now. Well, even, you know, dealing with people who are, are mal malingering, and I honestly don't know what that means, but I've heard it a lot, um, and manipulative, it's, it's never, ever, ever going to work to say, you're malingering, you're manipulative, you're, you know, and like, if, if we don't get in a space where we're joining them and saying, tell me about this, tell me, you know, why why do you, does this feel like the right move for you? Or, you know, however you might want to word that. And can, can we think of another way? And I'm, oh, I'll, I'll get into that later, but um, it's just, I, I think that maybe that's one big takeaway is right now from this piece is check your motives, check your intentions, check your judgments. Like, are you coming in with a preconceived idea of how this is supposed to go? And if you are, then, you know, you've got to, you have to go in almost as not vulnerable as them because you are, you have to have some um, confidence and you do bring in a skill set, and they have hired you for a service and for you to bring that competence but you need to go in with an empty notebook and just spend time, get to know them. And my therapist now is, I almost quit with him several times because we had to work on his stoic nature. I'm like, dude, you have got to mirror me. You have got to come meet me. But um, 
there was one time and all of those labels that had gone through <clears throat> that I had experienced, he, he's a Zen Buddhist monk. He meditates, he breathes. You can't often generally meditate and breathe if you have extreme trauma. It's just, there are ways to do such things, but sitting still and being quiet in your own head is not helpful generally. And, and so he kept trying, you know, to help me. And I'm like, that won't work. 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 And I'm engaged in my healing. I am engaged. I am proactive. I'm not just sitting there on a couch, spending my time and money. I'm engaged. I have a mission. I have things to do. I have life to live. I'm engaged in this. But I know what is going to set me off. I know what is not going to be good for me. And so I had some rocky years. But one time I was like, am I just oppositional? Am I just, you know, being resistant or whatever the words are that might, someone might be labeled? And he said, no, you're tenacious. And if I can't defend it, I shouldn't teach it. And I was like, Oh no, he said, you're spirited. Sorry, I got the wrong word. You're spirited. I use that in a good light in that situation. And he did, and I knew he meant it because he does not, well, he doesn't talk a whole lot generally, but um, I, I just knew he wouldn't give me an accolade that he didn't mean. And, and I knew what he meant and he explained. And it, that literally changed my perception of myself. And many ways you know it's like all those labels of again being oppositional or difficult or all of those words he saw it as spirited and and, and that is a, you know an attribute of mine that i value and anyway it just empowered me rather than making me feel small and insignificant or too broken to help it, it empowered me and it's not a big therapeutic moment where you go, oh my gosh, that one's in, you know, psych 10, 10, or, you know, like I did my clinicals and this is a skill set I came out with. It was just him really being with me, valuing me and my spirit and what I've done and, and who I, how I got to where I am. And it, I don't think that's hard to do, but it is hard to do. It's hard to step aside and just let it be, you know, and not, not expect something. It would not have worked if he'd been going, you're just not trying. I'm like, well, I'm not, because that's not going to work. So, but, you know, we banter. We fight, and it works. Yeah, I mean, really, the internal maneuvers <laughs> that a caregiver has to go through to be um, ready to truly meet you with that honoring. Uh, it sounds like, yeah, that's what a great example of doing that. You know, him, him being with you enough to to make that comment in a way that was so meaningful when he did yeah, yeah. and that really did change how i looked at myself in especially in a therapeutic world rather than just being that throwaway that problem child you know it, it made me feel like oh my gosh i am and these this questioning isn't bad it's good i want to be in charge of my own care i want to be an active participant in this healing journey rather than just having someone tell me. So it was empowering. Yeah, yeah. examples on, on, on both the dark side and the bright side, really. And, uh, and when it comes to talking to other survivors of complex trauma and horrific abuse, what are some of the challenges that you've uh, seen for their, well, really their healing and pursuit of justice? Um, gosh, everyone, can, can you, I'm hoping you can narrow that down because there are so many people and their experiences are so different. And Right. Um, so, so really, if I were to narrow it down, um, I'd probably ask, when it comes to the pursuit of justice, uh, what's, what are a couple of the challenges that you've noticed are they, they kind of keep popping up in a different way here and there? Is justice, do you mean legal? Yeah. Or, okay. Yeah, legal justice. So that is its own entire documentary. But I, I think if, if you're working with someone 
and your objective is we need to press charges, they need to get off the street, and, and we need to pursue this course, and, and that's imposed on them, that's not a good fit. I personally, I'm the kind that can look at something and act quick, break away, clean, and, and do things like that. But there's something called a trauma bond, you know, that a lot of people are aware of. There, there are so many complications and like tethers to trauma and, and the people and the relationships, even though they're harmful and hurtful, those are very, very complex and very um, intense. And a lot of people aren't ready to press charges. A lot of people feel more pressure and and it, it's not helpful to them when they are pressed to you know prosecute for instance and let's be fair and honest that doesn't generally go well if someone does go that route i'm not sure the success rate is so is high enough that not everyone can handle it not everyone can handle pressing charges, having it not stick and, and see their, their abuser put away. And then they're now unsafe and they've caused their abuser problems and, and now they're extra unsafe. So justice is, is tricky. And some people think that, oh, if they go to jail, you'll heal. And it's like, oh my gosh, no. It, it, some people that might be helpful, but some people know, because again, let's talk trauma bond. This person that they had this relationship with, whether it was harmful or not, is, is now over there. And for me, being removed from a space of trauma where it was happening every single day, opened floodgates for me to start remembering and processing. So it's, it's not like, oh, I'm free, I'm fine. It's like, oh my gosh, now I actually, can look at this stuff and the I had my first memory of being sexually abused when I was 19 I turned 20 in the psych ward after overdosing I did not want to hit 20 that was really hard for me and I still remember and I'm 50 so it's been 30 years and that no wonder I wanted out you know no I think I've probably felt what was coming and um, I'm glad I'm here, so don't get me wrong there, but there's a price to pay to heal. Like I said, healing is, as it's traumatic. It's, and maybe there are other ways to heal, but when you're, when you're really talking complex trauma, when you're talking multiple incidents of trauma over the course of probably years, especially if, if it happens when you're neural network is forming, when your ideas of the world and relationships are forming, it is very, very hard and terrifying and sad because you start to see things as they really are maybe and blinders are taken down and illusions are broken and it's hard. And not only is it hard on the, the survivor, and on the clinician, but it's hard on their support. They don't always know how to handle it. Because again, for me, I'm kind of chronically suicidal. And although I'm not self-harming now, I am covered in scars. And that is terrifying. That is terrifying for a support network. And, and they learn to talk about suicide, kind of like going to get lunch, you know? And, and like, well, how bad is this? Do I need to call in for help? Or are we gonna work through this? You know, or do you just need to talk? You know, it's 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 hard to navigate. It is. So I would really give that to you. Yeah, and really I think that if 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 I'm making this connection correctly, it really seems to to and, and the on the justice side as well as on the healing side it absolutely requires an honoring understanding, an, an appreciation of this is where this particular person is at, this is what she needs, uh, you know, and, and right now she needs healing before she's even ready to look at justice. She's got trauma bonds that are so 
uh, deeply knotted and tied up uh, with with the with the loyalties and the 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 love and the sort of Stockholm type, you know, the, the, it's, it's more than just a single incident or a single captivity. It's developmental. It's deep, and it's or it's 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 early as as uh, <laughs> it was when when people are developing the neural networks, the most important ones, their their views of the world, and so um, yeah, it seems like there's this there's definitely this this connection with when it comes to pursuit of justice honor them meet them where they where they are at meet them where we meet her where she needs to be met or where he needs to be met sorry i zipped out for a minute there yeah, you did we've had a little bit of that so yeah it's it's so important to okay so there is duty to report and if you're if you're working with a child and or you know of trauma of, of a child like you have to report that absolutely and and so that's um, that's a different case than maybe an adult who's telling you about what has happened. So, um, I actually have zero tolerance, and I probably need to work on this. If you know, when I work with people, of of tolerating brutality to children, and so I will report as I should, as I'm legally mandated to do. But every person is citizen, friend parent, whatever, we're mandated to report. And so that is an understanding that not everyone has. And, and so, but that is different than the pursuit of, of justice or, you know, trying to prosecute later. And in most cases, not all, but most, if a juvenile or if a child if their abuser is taken into custody, most prosecutors will try to do everything they can to take their, their testimony, record it, and the system isn't great. Sometimes it works, sometimes it does not work, and I've had some of the survivors I've worked with have it go really bad. They're, ideally, there's one report of, of the child saying it's recorded, for multiple agencies to be able to use like DCFS, the AG's office, you know, the local police, whoever, and the FBI. So it, so they don't have to repeatedly tell their story because again, that is traumatizing. And that puts a child in a situation where they're, they're just really not equipped for it. They are barely handling what's happening, let alone, they can't buy into this let me help you put this guy away thing. Cause that's again, someone maybe that they love. And so the pursuit of prosecution can happen independent and the child again, ideally will not have to testify or testify in front of their abuser, but that it gets messy. It gets messy. So sometimes it has to go forward and sometimes it's a choice to go forward. And that's an age thing. That's a agency thing as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, to help people appreciate the complexity both on an emotional level and on a, a procedural level. It's it, this is this is good information. And so, um, I'll just ask you this: I understand uh, that your vision for the healing center arose from both your own experience and seeing the experiences of others. Uh, and so what have you noticed that is already out there that both seems to be helping survivors for at least the, the ones that can access it? And um, also that's in an ideal world, what, I, what I'd ask you is what would you really like to see a lot more of out there? So what, what I'm excited about is the understanding of trauma is on such a higher level than it ever has been. And one book I will recommend to everyone who is either support or a clinician and, and survivors may or may not be able to digest this book. It, it triggers some for me, it triggered me, but it was worth it because I needed it. I, I was so hungry for it. Is The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. Um, I've listened to I, possibly every presentation he's ever given on YouTube. I attended his conference here in um, Utah. That was two or three days, I can't remember. And he 
academically, medically broke down the impact of trauma on the brain, on the body, the physiology, on every level and said, this is a real thing. And so this stuff I've been saying, like my brain is just broken. I, I go ready, fire and miss the whole aim. It's like, I can't, you know, the trigger hits and I'm out the door in five seconds. I, I don't have time to process. And he's saying, this is a real thing. This is why that's happening. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm not just oppositional. I'm not just all these things that people have been saying, even though I could hold that space for me, I was more like fighting for it than able to really have that conversation of this is what the amygdala just did. And this is what the hippocampus is doing. And, um, and I do have a few notes on that if, if we get into that, just for someone responding to trauma, because I think maybe question number four has something to do with that or five. Um, sure, I'd love, I'd love to go into that. Yeah. Because you're really, when you're, when you're looking at what you would really love to see more of, it kind of seems like woven into every caregiving service, woven into the activities of every safe house, uh, woven into uh, every residential, every lockdown unit, every outpatient clinic and, and urgent care where, 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 this, where, where, where people are seeing these phenomena, um, it kind of sounds like really your notes would be the right thing when it comes to what you would suggest for caregivers. I mean, I know I've seen people like who've been in- I can go all day on that, abuse, for sure. You know, yeah, and it's like, yeah, so, so if, you have, if you have some notes to share for care, caregivers and clinicians, yeah. um, I'd love to hear them. I, I think we need to do another Zoom and just go through my like presentation because yeah, oh we should. I, I feel like it's we should honestly we should do another one and go through your presentation and because yeah. the the more good information out there from people who have survived and from people who are who have this lived experience is uh, utterly valuable because because how how great would it be for somebody who's who's finding their body shaking and convulsing with with when they finally feel peace who want to run, scream, and hide when they're finally feeling safe, who's, who are having massive upheavals and hot flashes and vomiting. And, you know, I mean, it's, uh, and, and, uh, and, and then these urges where they need, need to change how they feel and cut themselves. How would, how great would it be to have caregivers who don't just jump all over them and try to restrain them and try to get them chemically, you know, give them the happy shot and restraint, you know, chemical restraint, physical restraint, tie them down, they're shaking, we can't have them shaking. People who can actually be there with them and honor it. I mean, this is the kind of- That was my experience until I went to St. Mark's and that's where I had my best experience. But um, to, back to your question, just so we don't totally abandon it is, I, I feel like the awareness is rising and there are people who are becoming much more skilled. So they are learning, they're going to workshops, they're taking courses in EMDR and you know, and understanding the connection between, uh, you work a lot with addiction, addiction and trauma. And, you know, there, so people are really pursuing the education and understanding it. And so now the complex trauma issue isn't so weird or unknown, like people are acknowledging it, that it really is something. So I think Bessel van der Kolk and all of the colleagues whose research he put together in this book and he cites them. So if you like someone's work, you can go and study them further. Um, so it just, it, it was, it was life changing for me. And it made me feel like, okay, I need to pursue this as far as understanding it more because it is intriguing. It's, Again, life, it's my personal life I'm reading on these pages. But also, you know, being that kind of liaison between trauma and, and treatment. Of, I could talk about that again in a minute, but what there isn't out there and why, I'm, why we're creating the Healing Center, why this group got together. I, as a survivor, I, as, some, as someone who'd been in multiple hospitals, who had seen multiple therapists, who had, was really, when I left the last hospital, we looked all over the country to find someone 
or an agency or a hospital, anything that would work with someone like me who had dissociation, who had flashbacks, self-harm, eating disorder, um, all, of, all of these things. I, I have not gone down the road of addiction as far as like chemical addiction. So thankfully I had that, but there was literally nothing. There were, there were agencies that worked with dissociation, but you know, I, I wasn't functioning. I was having flashbacks 24 seven. I needed a place that wasn't a psych ward where my room is next to a pedophile or someone who's screaming, I'm going to kill you or go cut yourself. You know, that's not a really safe environment for trauma. Maybe it keeps you alive. And that is the basic, uh, you know, premise of, a three day hospital stay is to get you out of the crisis, stabilize you. But it just, with someone with profound tra trauma, it's traumatizing. And, and so as we looked, there just really was nothing. And so it's been five years now. And as I've, I've worked as a case manager and I've literally called all over the country myself to try to find care for clients and survivors, it's just not there. There are emerging groups that understand, again, this trauma more and they can do therapy, but there isn't the housing, there isn't the safe place to refuge and be while you're going through this. And it's a lot for families and friends to manage. And again, you know, you talk about dissociation and, and those the self-harm and all of those things, they erupt and not because someone's weak, but because it is a you know, reaction to trauma. It's a trauma response. And just having a safer environment for, for all of that to happen, because it will, is, is just the goal because I didn't have that. And again, I'm covered in scars and People can see that as weakness or people can see that as my battle wounds. I'm still here. I'm still pushing through. I have figured out how to stay. It hasn't been pretty. It's been scary for everybody. And my colleagues who are working with me on this in year one have in their own practice, in their own work, seen all the holes and the inability to find safe, adequate care for their um their clients, their survivors, their patients, you know, whether it's doctors or social workers or therapists. Sorry, she shows me, I love her. She always has to be in my business, so. Um, and losing, losing people to, because I am tenacious, I am spirited, I am those things, I keep pressing and fighting through. But I know that that isn't, there's a limit to what people can really handle. And even me with all of my calling, all of my advocacy and my intention, I still hit very dark places where suicide feels and, and sounds just rational and reasonable and like the best option. And although I have a support that I can work through that with and, and I have my own self that is fiercely fighting that, I still, still go there in my head. And so we have to have places and people who can manage that and, and help us. And um, it's just the safety of having people around that get it, that aren't having to work through their own issues and their own ideas of trauma or their own ideas of what the resiliency of a soul should look like you know, kind of a team that really has the same value system. And um, so again, people are emerging, they're, they're learning how to work, but there just aren't the, the places that are safe to do so yet established. And um, like my therapist, we've been winging it for five years. Has it been five years? Five years. You know, we figured out how to make it work, but it's been hard. I've spent a lot of time alone in his office, you know, when he had to leave and it would have been great if someone were there to help me, you know, finish coming out of a, a flashback or 
and help orient me and just be. So we are creating this and it will be best practices, but very, very survivor led, very survivor informed. One of the things that I have felt most empowered by is my therapist honoring my intelligence and honoring my own pursuits and goals. And my ver version and vision of healing is going to be different than someone else's. I have an idea of where I want to end up and that may not be someone else's. And so letting them, giving them their, their God-given gift of their own voice to state what they need and want. And sometimes they don't know. And that's when you're maybe able to come in and say, well, here's the menu. Here are the options. What of this sounds best? And, and, and then when someone is really not okay, they're really in a dangerous place. I am an advocate for that quick hospital stay. And that's eventually we want to have the ability to handle that acuity level with the healing center because that it's it is a minute sometimes between I'm okay and I'm grabbing something that's lethal and I'm gone for me anyway especially with the dissociation and the DID it it can just be seconds and I am out of here or I am hurting myself or and so just being able to manage the varying degrees of wherever someone is in their healing journey and and do it safely, do it competently, do it kindly, in a very just respectful way. And knowing knowing there are times when it needs to be more intense, just to keep them and and yourself safe. So it, it's complicated. I won't even pretend it's not, which is why we've been working on this for two and a half years and we're still working on it. But we're getting closer. We are. We have the ideas, we know what we want. We just need to get some money, like a lot, and and start building it. Yeah. But that's the idea, is to be able to manage all the levels of, of care needed at any given moment, knowing it changes. And if someone will go forward, my hospital stays were over the course of 25 years, you know, they, they were spread out, because I'd have moments of doing better than like, a memory would come or a, a new wave of unearthing that unimaginable would come and I would just be taken out for two or three years, like long, long periods of time that were very scary for everyone. And so the idea is just have that con continuity of care of people who know you, who aren't going to so what are you getting out of this by relapsing? So what's your objective? What do you really want or need? You know, like, I don't know. I'm like, I yeah. am a very powerful person. I am smart. I am very capable. The last thing I need is to be in a psych ward. But, you know, for whatever people are thinking I'm gaining from it, not, it's, it is a hard place. Right, and really, I mean, there we have it. I mean, this is this is this is a a, a work of education, a work of a work of spirit, <laughs> requiring spirited people to be in this. Uh, this is this is a work that's that's. Uh, it, I, I've got to say, for the, the the short time, shorter time that I've been with you on on and just d d talking and uh, you know, piecing things together. It, it 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 seems truly like there's like this this power flowing through you when, when we work together on these things when you talk about these things, and uh, I'm excited uh, for 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 each little step of development that that's going to unfold. Thank you so much for taking your time, and yes, we do need to get together and have that presentation shared. Um, if if I can take just a few more minutes, so I want to make sure people have a takeaway, like something they can do. Yeah. Um, and, and so I'm just going to go into the brain just a teeny tiny bit um, as, as for just for practitioners or anyone just to look at, at maybe a, what's going on it maybe they're having a flashback they're dissociated they're they're self-harming whatever is going on um, 
if we think of how the brain forms, it, it forms from the brainstem to the prefrontal cortex. So it, it goes little to big. And, and everything back here that forms first is just basic survival. It's very primitive. It's called the reptilian brain. It is your basic need to survive instincts. And then it goes into the limbic system, which is your amygdala and your hippocampus. And that, there, I, I wrote that down. That's the, that's the threat detector. That's the place where you store memories where kind of your map of the world. So as your neural network is forming, as that brain is forming, as all of, all of your ideas of, am I safe, am I not safe? Will I be able to eat what I need to eat? Will I not? Will I, will I be hurt if I express this? Will I be safe? Everything that is, is forming is your idea of how, how this thing works, how this whole world and interactions and interpersonal connections work. And, and then the, the prefrontal cortex, which I don't spend a whole lot of time here still, um, that's your rational thinking. That's your, your problem solving. That's your, you know, I, I can think, I can sit with this, I can, I can map this out. That's that part of the brain. When someone is triggered or when someone is in a trauma response, this completely goes offline. Bessel van der Kolk has done brain scans offline. There's no light. It's really, it's not acting up. What is acting up is that limbic system. So the amygdala, the threat detector, the hippocampus with the memories informing the amygdala, the threat detector, and that, that survival brain. And so, if you can at least look at, at this person and, and see someone who is not in a rational state of mind, so you telling them or reasoning with them isn't going to work. It's, it's just not. And, and so helping them orient. So safety, they want safety, you want safety. So realizing you both have the same objective right now is, is safety then you, you just go really a lot more simple. Hey, do you know where you are? Let me just tell you who I am. You're safe. And they may or may not respond you know, quickly, but if you are just trying to rationalize with them, I'm sorry, you just might as well be in outer space talking to the moon because it's not going to register. And so Bessel van der Kolk will, he really stresses working from the back forward help them feel safe, spend as much time as it takes. Um, if they are not, if they are acting out, you might need to judge that. And is this something that a Band-Aid will fix or do we need extra help? You know, that's something that you have to judge and don't compromise their safety or your safety. You know, make, make a wise decision, but it's just, incredibly important to just kind of meet where, them where they are. Don't expect something of them that they're not capable of. If, if they're, again, just really in a reactive state, just be with them, you know, get down on their level. Uh, a presence is much more impactful than lots of words, you know. And telling someone to breathe isn't going to work, but sometimes maybe breathing so they can kind of hear and feel it, that sometimes works. So just kind of finding little tricky ways to get into that system to kind of help it slow down, help it calm, help it orient to here and now. And once that prefrontal cortex comes back online, once they can actually hear and process what you're saying, then they can start responding to some of your, you know, suggestions and directions. And, and be honest, like if you don't know what to do, say it. People can detect bullshit fast, and especially survivors. They've learned how to read people. They know. They know if you're scared, and and you can even say, I'm scared. I don't know what to do, but I'll help you. We'll figure it out. I will make the phone calls to find answers. I will do the research. I, you know, we'll figure this out. So own what you do and don't know. But don't act scared. <laughs> I mean, even if you are, you can be, but like, you're there as their help. So be in that space, like own that space for yourself and just say, I really don't know. I, this, 
you know, I, I am scared, but because I care about you, but we'll figure it out. So it's just honesty and transparency is just really important. And then just simplifying and going from there. Yeah. I don't know. I, I just, I want people to have something that they can take away and use. So that's yeah. why. I, I mean, because <laughs> the, the inner conflict that arises for the caregiver, I mean, just having been the caregiver, I really appreciate that because um, to, to be able to, to, to admit, hey, you know, look, I'm, 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 I'm actually scared and don't know what to do, but then hold, hold to that belief that I know that this can get better. I know that there's a way to help this person. I just don't know what it is yet. And then just being able to exude the confidence, you know, that this can work out while acknowledging, yeah, I'm actually kind of scared. I don't know what to do exactly with this, but I'm here for you. I mean, what, what a useful thing to know. But I'm not going anywhere. You know, I'm here, yeah. we'll, we'll figure this out. I, I probably have said, I don't know what to do more times than I've said, I do know what to do. Because again, we're, we're dealing with very fragile things and, and lives that are, they're incredibly strong and resilient, but they're in a fragile space. And finding the right thing and taking time to do that is way better than just throwing some fast, logical solution that isn't going to be a good one to someone so I've, I've had to do that a lot and, and sometimes you're left with all bad bad choices all of them they're all all really hard but letting you know inviting them into that space where okay this is really all we have right now help me decide what you want to do in in with these options they have to have voice and choice they just have to being in trauma, being trafficked, being you know tortured, being having memories stripped and your will taken, if they don't have a voice now in their healing, when will they? You know, they have to have it. And so it's their God given voice. So honor it. And maybe they don't want to respond to you right now or ever. And that is their choice. And then again, with regards to children, you do have to report, but, and if you know someone is suicidal, you know, and that is a, a scary thing, you, you have to act. That's, that's when I feel like choice is no longer theirs. And I'm very clear with my, with people I work with, I'm like, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to, you know, work with you and, and you have voice again, you have choice, but if you are suicidal, I will act. And so they know straight off the bat. This one is where you, you may not get to choose my response, but please be honest with me because I'm here for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kim. So Looking forward to further work and, and uh, further things to present. Yeah. yeah. So, um, for just for your audience, and, and you can put this in written form, you know, if you are working with someone or a friend of someone who is a human trafficking survivor, the National Suicide Prevention Hotline is 1-800-273-8255. That's the Polaris Project. They're connected to every state, you know, to some, to the AG's office, or they, they will connect wherever this is viewed, you to the appropriate help. And there's a text line, and this is a crisis text line. It's, it's a good one, 741741. So if you're a survivor, if you're dealing with trauma, 741741, it's anonymous. No one is going to come after you um, if, if you know, you're scaring them. But you know, if you need help, they will probably try to, to get further help. And then, Oh, sorry, the suicide, National Suicide Prevention Hotline is 1-800-273-8255. I have a lot. The National Trafficking Hotline, I'm sorry, is 1-888-373-7888. And, um, and if you want to educate yourself on human trafficking and trauma, there's the Polaris Project, Operation Underground Railroad has education. Um, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention has mental health help. NAMI.org has, again, mental health and suicide prevention help. And the organization, the Healing Center for Complex Trauma, that website is 
the Healing Center for Complex Trauma.org. If you want to say what we're doing is very minimal right now, our website, but we're working on it. And Operation Underground Railroad is our.org. So OURrescue.org, sorry. I type it in. I don't say it out loud very often. It, it, the thumb has memory, but I don't know. You just and don't feel don't feel bad about calling. And if you're a support and you are um, you don't have to be a survivor to you access these. And so you you can call and get advice on any of these lines for what to do. And you as a survivor can call and get help on any of these lines. So they're there for everyone, which I think is great because sometimes you don't know what to do and someone can help you through that process on both ends. Excellent. Thanks so much for sharing those. Yeah. Thanks for having me.